Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in to an episode here at Fast Break Live for I Sports Radio, your direct free for all sports. On tonight's show, we talk Lakers. What's wrong with them? What do they do to get better? And is there a trade a horizon within the franchise? Plus, Draymond Green is returning tomorrow on MLK Day against the Memphis Grizzlies. Can his return spark the Warriors into a nice winning streak? Also, we talk about John Moret's season in the injury and what the Grizzlies should do. Plus, we go over all the scores around the world of basketball and college pros here on IE Sports Radio. But this is Fast Break. Thank you for tuning in with us. We're ready to give you a great show. And th- join us as you shout tonight, ladies and gentlemen. But thank you for tuning in where you are in this world. I know here in the States, here in Alabama, D lock in Pittsburgh. He said it was like 10 degrees up there. It's make we may get some snow here in Alabama in the next few hours. So oh joy. But this is basketball we're talking about. And the game's playing indoors during this time period. So we're gonna discuss all that. And a lot of things here tonight. D lock, how you doing tonight, sir? Everything is going pretty good, man. Um, it is pretty much, uh, you know, cold here, you know, about 13, 14 degrees. Uh, but very much prepared for it. Um, checking out the scores, you know, on tonight. Also watching the Cowboys be Cowboys in the playoffs as well. So very interesting. Uh, interesting MLK weekend started. Yeah, it's going to be. MLK day tomorrow. And, you know, I think that's kind of like a perfect segue to talk about this individual. Draymond Green, D-Lock, is on pace to return tomorrow against the Memphis Grizzlies. On a uh, big uh, MLK day tomorrow, the game's looking like this. The Rockets versus the Sixers. Pelicans versus the Mavericks. Magic uh, versus Knicks. Pistons, Wizards, uh, Spurs, Hawks, Warriors, Grizzlies, Bulls, Cavaliers, Nets, Heat, Celtics, Raptors, Jazz, Pacers, and Lakers and Thunder. But the main one, I think the main ones people will keep an eye on are the Grizzlies, Warriors with Draymond's return, Magic, Knicks, who, with the Knicks being a uh, strong team after the trade with the Raptors, and of course the Lakers, who we'll talk about here momentarily. But to go to Draymond real quick, D-Lock, in the Memphis and Warriors game, what are you looking for in Draymond's return to the lineup for Golden State. Well, I'm expecting um the defense to play a hell of a lot better. You know, the physicality that they need that he brings, uh, that'll be something that would definitely be noticed. Um I don't think he'll get a full, you know, full game minutes. Uh, I think it'll probably be monitored just to work him in. Uh, I expect him to not be as uh, argumentative with refs. They're definitely going to have their eyes on him. Um, and I think, like I said, I think it's going to be you know good for Golden State, which is what they need. You know, with the guy that they have. You know, we talked about last show with Kaminga comments and others, uh, but having Draymond Green back in the building is a big thing for them. 
and it's something that is needed. Um, so I, mean, I can't say it'll automatically change, but I know it's definitely something that this team uh, needs uh, because, again, uh, that – without Draymond Green that we've seen it not just this year but years past that we don't have Draymond Green down there. Um bigs do whatever the hell they want against Golden State. Uh so you know I think bring him back into the lineup in his presence. Uh I expect that to be a huge impact, especially against a team like Memphis, who, you know, we'll talk about losing one of their star players and John Moran for the rest of the year. They're probably gonna lean a lot more on Jaron Jackson. So uh, having somebody like a Draymond in uh, is going to play the you know the end of it. Who 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 wins that game? Which both teams need desperately. <laughs> I think for me, when I looked looked at looked at this and it's all the news today, I saw it like this. I, you know. What a what a good job by the league to do this. Like, to do this, to make his return on MLK Day, that was kind of a stroke of genius by the NFL. Like, okay, you make you go to counseling, make you do all this stuff, lost a lot of money. All right, we're going to have you come back on Martin Luther King Day. A man, you know, that always, you know, talks about, well, in some people's eyes, trying to bring the world together in peace and all that stuff. I'm not going to go on the specifics of it, but, you know, if you dive into Dr. King's, like, real history and stuff like that, before his death, you know, there's some things that he kind of regret that he had done, but we ain't gonna get all that specifics today. But on the surface of it, you know, the league is gonna have Draymond out in MLK Day, you know, trying to be more a peaceful person on the court. And, you know, you guess, you know, one of your arch rivals that you've been against the past couple of years, the Memphis Grizzlies. So, like I said, I think it's like stroke of genius by the league to bring it back on MLK Day. And all that good stuff. You know, on a for the basketball team, you know, this team had a big comeback against the Bulls the other day, which I kind of want to get your thoughts on that and that Jerry Krause situation in a little bit. But, you know, they came back and won that game against the uh, the Bulls. Big time win. Needed that win. You know, in my humble opinion. But then, you know, you win that game. And then you go out to the Bucks the other night. You know, you lose 129 to 118. No Steph Curry. That's a huge plus. But Kaminga, he had 28 points. Thompson had 21. And my thing with Kaminga in that game, D Log, like he played so well. But then Steve Kerr takes him out. And I think that's that's always been a lucky thing with these young guys that these guys play well or whatever or have a couple of mistakes. Steve Kerr just yanks him out just very quickly. But like, how are you going to have these guys build repetition, all that stuff? If you're yanking them for purposes, you know what I'm saying? So hopefully with Draymond coming back, like you alluded to, bring him back slowly. Don't throw him into the starting lineup. Bring him on slowly. 
don't cut Kamiga's yeah. and also don't cut Kamiga's minutes just because Draymond's coming back. Go ahead. Right. Um, I agree with you there with that. Uh, just for like, you know, you want it to be to where, you know, you got, you still want to work with Kaminga in that. And also, trade deadline is coming up fairly soon. So, you know, that could weigh how they use any any player. But, you know, right now, you don't need to put Draymond and throw him in and take out uh, Kaminga completely. Um, give him that rotation, you know, and um, let it roll. I mean, I think that's the biggest, biggest thing. And I think that if they can do that, then, uh, you know, you might see a difference, like I said, on the defensive side, which is what they need. Uh, so, you know, we know what Draymond is. We know the history that he has in Golden State. Um, you know, many times there have been talks of them possibly trading him, which I don't think will happen. So at this point, um, and I think that squeezing him him in, getting him those minutes and slowly bringing him back can be more beneficial than just throwing him in and giving him 30-plus minutes. And going to the chat real quick, I want to shout y'all guys out. How y'all doing tonight? Uh, shout out to uh, Terry Rodriguez. Terrence said, I hope you have two saying warm. Yeah, we're 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 good. We're good. You know, so we'll see how things go overnight. Mark and shout out to Marcus Los. Great. Salute to you, sir. Dream, I mean, uh, Marcus saying I need Draymond to swing on the first cat he <laughs> faces. <coughs> I dang ain't gonna happen. <laughs> That man, they been sending that man to counseling, shock therapy, whatever you want to call it. To get this back to this point. Let me ask you this. Let me ask y'all in the chat as well. Did y'all ever buy into the Draymond might retire stuff? Did you buy into that D lock? Nah. I think that was just talk. Um, I feel like you know, that was just something just to talk about. Um, maybe considering not necessarily re- retiring, but just feeling bothered by him, saying, well, hell, he can't play how he wants to. Um, maybe he needs to play. Maybe he needs to hang it up. But I don't think he really was considering uh, retiring at all. Um, I just think that that was something that, you know, was thought about to see what kind of attention that it, it gets. And granted, you know, a lot of people paid attention to it. A lot of people heard it. So, attention was was given towards it but you know playing with the guy that he played with hey i don't see him retiring uh, anytime soon because the unit that he has and the fact that they'll always be consistently competitive in the west so i mean like i said it sounds good to just say but to completely hang it up i definitely didn't think that was like a serious serious thought in his mind I, I I I mean I don't I don't know how his money situation is, but I, I'm like, like dude, man, you just signed a three year contract, you know. Plus, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you live in California, and some of those taxes would be eating up, but still, you just signed a three year contract. I, I didn't buy it, man. It's like, that's a lot of money to walk away. A lot of money. So I didn't buy that at all. I'm going to be real about that. I, I didn't buy it, didn't buy it, didn't buy it. Going uh, to the rest of the chat, uh, Taryn said, the USC women's hoops team beat UCLA and handled their first loss of the season. Saving win. Yeah. Big time win for um the uh, women's team. And um, let me pull the stats for that. Um, yeah. uh, let me pull that up real quick. Uh, 
Yeah, to beat them, uh, 73 65. Uh, Twenty-five points for uh, Osborne, ten points for um, Lauren Benz off the bench, which I don't know why she ain't starting. And side note, Lauren Betts' uh, mother follows the show on uh, on X. Uh, I was just throwing it out there, and she got a Lauren Betts. Well, they got a younger sister that committed to UCLA as well. She's one of the top players in the nation. And then they got like a younger brother, D Lock, the Betts. That's like, I think he's in middle school. And I think the, they said the kids are already like um, about 6'10. These. Yeah. And she's, and the mom posted some video on X, like, you know. Him playing AAU uh, not too long ago, and I think the kids still trying to figure things out. But you kind of see, okay, if this kid kind of puts it together. We talking like, you know, future NBA player. Because uh, Lauren Betts, she's six seven. I don't got the uh, younger sister's uh, height in front of me, but. She, I think she's about 6'3", 6'4", as well. And like I said, I just mentioned about the brother. He's already 6'10", in middle school. It's a tall-ass family. But yes, big-time win for USC uh, women's hoops. Uh, Juju Watkins, 32 points for her, 10, is, uh, 10 rebounds, 4 fouls. Got cleaned up a little bit. But I, mo- I never marched the game for her. I... If Clayton, if Caitlin Clark, I'll say this, D. Lock. If Caitlin Clark wasn't getting on the headlines, I think Juju Watkins would probably be up there for Player of the Year. So Caitlin Clark playing out of her mind this year, I think Player of the Year would go to her, barring injury. But you know, a great win for uh, USC in the Battle of L.A. Also, um, uh, that step back that Kevin Cart did a couple uh, a recent game, and <coughs> that girl she's balling that. Oh yes, yes. She like she is kind of take her game to another level. It's like she is taking her game. I guess you know, that game gets Michigan to say she is taking her. Her game this year to another level. That so much so I think she got the number one seed. I mean, a number one overall pick lock. And mind you, you know, the Indiana Fever. I think I I think got the first overall pick. You know, for the uh, NFL draft. I mean, uh, WNBA draft. So you kind of like keep her in quote unquote and. Midwest with this type of move. I think that's probably like the selling point there if you're trying to do like that, do it that way. Uh, going over to the chat right now, uh, Marcus said, never change Draymond. <laughs> Terrence said, Draymond would be Draymond no matter what. Marcus, exactly. Yeah, that's true. Mark is saying Kamiga is trash. I hate to say it. Nah, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. He said the kid is too inconsistent. Well, what well, well, this little too? The kid is playing great, but Steve Kerr pulled him out in the fourth. So if the kid got a high hand like that, you gotta let it ride. You know what I'm saying? You gotta let it ride. This is for my whole boy opinion. And then he said, um, Wiggins should be traded in immediately. Before we move forward, on, on Andrew Wiggins, I saw some reports saying that his trade value is cold. Cold as it is like you are up in Pittsburgh right now. Cold. <laughs> what? 
I know we talked about, you know, the war is making a move for like a veteran or something like that. Can they get anything out of Wiggins in your opinion? Mm. I don't know. That's pretty tough, man. I mean, coming off that NBA final championship, you possibly. I don't think so now. Um, now, I feel like he is a player that they can use. But I, I think that, you know, now, you know, the Warriors are in that situation where they got all these pieces. And they just got to they gotta set up their rotation. You know, we've seen a trade earlier with the Pistons that I was talking about with the Wizards. You know, Pistons get rid of some of their centers or their big men to make room for the others. Yeah. And I think, and that was a move that they had to make for the rotational pieces. Uh, and that may be something that uh, the Warriors could be possibly dealing with. I mean, you know, we talk about bringing Draymond Green back, you know, and not necessarily cutting out Kaminga, you know, but you got all these other guys, your guards, you know, that are going to come in and get minutes that can make a big, big play and make a big, be a big part of this team. You know, Kevin Looney as well. So, and I am sorry. So I think, like I said, this team uh, has a lot of pieces. And, uh, you know, Andrew Wiggins right now is kind of getting lost in that, uh, trying to get back to find that role that he's going to play a big part in. Um, so I kind of can see that, you know, his his trade dropped down completely cold like that, but that's because he just hasn't been playing. You know, it hasn't been consistent. Um, now maybe he is could be one of those players that just show up big time during the playoffs, which it would be great for them. Um, but again, uh, right now, I don't really see you know, teams getting much if they wanted to go for um, they wanted to go for Andrew Wiggins. I, I, to mar- you know, to bring up Marcus's point, if you if you feel like you gotta make a change, I, which I think I think both of us in the same boat they, that they should. I think Wiggins is the one piece they're gonna trade away because you know salary purposes, all that stuff. But you know, you know, with like you alluded to about Detroit and Washington doing their trade, you know, you kind of free got the the glut of centers up there, and you made more space for more time for like Wiseman, you know, Isaiah Stores pending return, and then also you now have an I now you got these two stretch forwards and Sarge and Muscula. And now, you, you, you know, you have Isaiah Stewart doing his role and not shooting three-pointers. You know, now you got these two guys that you bring off the bench that can shoot three-pointers and not have Isaiah shoot 10, ten down three-pointers in a game. Which is stupid. But, uh, God, for Wiggins, I don't know, man. It's like, Siakam's on the block. That's another name that's been coming about the past couple of days. Siakam, I mean, yeah, he's been rumors for a while, but I think now he's on the block. You know, do you take a stab out of him? Potentially. I don't know. I mean, you send it, you will be sending Wiggins back to his home country. Could that be like a motivating factor? Maybe, maybe not. Gordon Hayward, he's available. But, I mean, that's like a huge risk because he can't stay on the damn court. Right. You know, and also, oh, Dylan, let me see, like this idea. Marcus brought up in the chat. How about like a package to the Bulls for DeMar Rosen?
like maybe like Wiggins, Moses Moody. Mm. Gary Payton, and then uh, and the Bulls send back DeRozan. This is the top top of my head. Send back DeRozan, and maybe Caruso back in the deal. Not a bad free. I mean, I feel like one thing that the Warriors do have a lot of is guards, but. You know, replacing, you see a Moody with a Caruso, that, I think that's a big upgrade, in my opinion, on the defensive side, um, which is what they're struggling with. So, uh, wouldn't be bad. Um, I feel like, I think you sent me that tweet that said something about Booch getting out of Chicago. <laughs> no, but <laughs> so, somebody they say, yeah. the trade tra- Booch a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was funny, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, my thing is, hell, do they explore that as well? You know, um, but again, you know, getting the Rosen would be a big piece for Golden State. It just like like we you know alluded to, you know, moving uh, <laughs> Andrew Wiggins is gonna be pre- pretty tough. That's gonna be something very, very tough to do. So, um, but. I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, you, know, you can see teams that started to make the trades prior to the trade deadline already, just because um, you know we had we had even talked about it you know, about teams making moves just because they just want to be relevant or make moves. So I wouldn't be surprised if somebody you know did try to make a move for a Wiggins and possibly you know throw something to Golden State that they. But they can't refuse. And the and the Rose's name being up the trade block. Well, yeah, man, Zach Levine's name being in the trade block for a good while. You know? Vucevic, I, I don't know. And I think he'd be kind of hard to trade because, you know, 33, 34, signed a three year contract. I don't think nobody would want to touch that contract right now. But he'd be hard to move. You know, it, like to back to Marcus' proposed idea. If you're going to stay, you can possibly swing Andre Drummond in that hypothetical trade. Man, you'd be sitting pretty. You throw Chicago a, a just throw Chicago an unprotected first round pick. So like Wiggins, Moody. You know, Gary Payton. Um, future first round pick from DeRozan, Caruso, and Drummond. Oh, you're cooking right there. Because Drummond's been playing pretty damn well. Like a good, a strong bounce back year. He's having a nice, strong bounce back year. Which I think it would probably net him a big contract somewhere in all season. If you get Drummond in the fold, kind of sort that Sam position rebounding wise, and kind of revitalize things that way. To go on DeRozan who could pick up that scoring slack. If Clay Thompson ain't playing well, and another thing too. If 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 you get if going to say get a DeRozan, you got a nice strong mentor. I'm not saying these other guys are mentors on the Warriors, but you get this nice strong mentor for Kaminga. How I see it in my eyes. Because Andre Iguodala ain't there no more. We talk about Draymond. I don't think he's not that type of role model for your squad. I'm not saying Curry or Thompson is either, but don't show. I mean, you don't hear stories about that. 
Hell, you hear stories about that about Kobe. And some some folks think he's like uh don't know they like one of the worst teammates ever. But you know, for, you know, talk about Chicago side of things. You know, that at one point they played pretty well, but this team is due for a split with some of their stars. Yeah. To stay on the Bulls real quick, D Lock. Jerry Krause got inducted to their uh, Ring of Honor a couple days ago. And we talked on this show about the last dance, all that. You know, the pandemic, well, the pandemic shutdowns, all that stuff. And we talked about that on the show. And Jerry, and Jerry Krause on that documentary we talked about wasn't the best received individual in it. And I think, you know, because Jordan didn't like the guy and, you know, more people like Michael Jordan and stuff like that and then compared to Jerry Krause. <laughs> but, you know, they had Jerry Krause's uh, widow, I mean, late wife, I mean, not late wife, excuse me, wrong words, right? Had his uh, wife there she was there to, to honor to take uh the honor in his place. And the people booed during the ceremony. That's insane right there. What, what's your thoughts on that, you know, in your opinion? Like Yeah, Jerry Krause may have his had his faults during that run. But you can't deny what the man did for Chicago. The scouting, you know, hiring the, the Phil Jackson, you know, get bring guys in like you know Scotty Pippen, you know Ron Hopper, you know Luke Longley. You know, all those rock, get trained for Dennis Robin. That's big. That was big. And all that good stuff. What are your thoughts on, you know, his legacy with the Bulls, in your opinion, and how you feel about the fans booing him, even though he brought, helped bring the, the team's best success and notoriety during that time? What are your thoughts on, on that whole thing there? Well, I mean, knowing watching the, um, you know, watching the, the last day documentary, um, it seems like a lot of fans watched it, right? Um, a lot of them felt some type of way about the situation. Obviously, a lot being on the side of Michael Jordan because of what he'd done and what he brought to Chicago. Um, I think that. You know, it made it seem as if um, it, he's not a perfect person. So it seemed like they didn't care about that. You know, they seen him, seen you know the bad of what he's done. Um, person that's not here anymore. I think they should have shown him more respect for that. Um, and it was a hurtful thing to see. I just, you know, you have people that. And care less about outside of the sport of basketball, outside of the sport for entertainment. And that's the part that really sucks to see that. So, um, you know, Mr. Krause is a human just like everybody else. You know, so he's going to have mistakes. He's going to live his life, have different things. You know, especially for his wife to be there uh, shows you, you know, how some people act. So, uh, it really sucked. sucks to see that. Um, but I think this is something that's not going to change a different in any sport or any entertainment business. Um, you're going to see, you know, people feel that type of way regardless of 
you know, what you do, they're going to pick a side in different situations. And, you know, clearly, like I said, you know, for those that did watch the last dance documentary, there were things about Mr. Krause that, that they didn't, didn't appreciate, you know, players talked about, you know, uh, coaches talked about, talked about how they picked on him for different things, decisions that were made, um, you know, leaving obviously at the end saying, hey, well, if you keep that crew together, they could possibly win another ring, um, you know, these different things. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're all human beings, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, with things happening, you know, you still have a hell of a run with you know, the greatest player of all time, you know, winning uh, six championships. And I mean, to see that, he played a huge part in that. You know, we talk a lot of compare. A lot of people compare, you know, what LeBron has done with or without the crew that he has. Uh, they compare him to Michael Jordan. And you know, one biggest thing a lot of people say is Michael Jordan could not have done it with a Scotty, a Scotty Pippen, or a Dennis Rodman, you know, or a Phil Jackson. So, um, and Jerry Crow played a huge part in that. So, um, to me, I feel like, you know, show the man some respect. Be grateful. You know, because, okay, you didn't win seven. But you got six. And you got the greatest play of all time. And one of the reasons is because of the title runs that they went on. You know, so um, he played a huge part in that. And like I said, he's a he's a person that isn't perfect. He's going to have mistakes and decisions that's going to impact many. So uh, for me, I feel like that was kind of classes with with. With, with with what most with all of the people the fans that booed, um, so show some respect and understand what he has done because if he wasn't there, who knows what what the Bulls would have right now? I know. That's the biggest thing that um, I think is being looked over. Um, as much as what Michael Jordan has done, I mean, hell, people still buying his shoes to this day, right? He's done so much. Um, but I think Mr. Cross had a lot to do with, it, you know, and, you know, we continue to talk about how they kept running into the Pistons or the Celtics and they couldn't get past them. But then he takes a few pieces from the Pistons and put a little squad together. And now this team is a, you know, is a dynasty and one of the greatest teams ever, you know. Um, and I'll say this, it seems like, but not to go off topic, but it seems like this last this this last dance uh, documentary has really showed a lot of colors, man. You know, people had different things that they talked about. Um, hell, you have you know this situation uh, with Mr. Krause, how they treated him. You know, now Scotty comes, Scotty Pippen feels some type of way. Like it's a lot of stuff <laughs> that the last dance documentary really reveals. You know, and um, this also shows us, and this is the thing that I kind of bothered most is about the, the booing is people got to realize that, that entertainers are more than just entertainers. You know, they have a life outside of that. And, you know, that goes with players, that goes with coaches, that goes with general managers, you know, that goes with owners. Like, they have lives outside of, you know, uh, the job that they perform. You know, as far as entertaining and winning, you know, they have their different things. And they clearly show by showing they should know that by seeing, you know, Mr. Crow's wife there. So, uh, I feel like they could have responded a hell of a lot better than that. Uh, but also, you see how people uh, do see you. A lot of times, you're not benefiting them or entertaining them. This is how they treat you. Um, so, it, it sucks to see that. Um, and hopefully... You know, we see other fan bases, other people uh, acting different, you know, when they're um, the, fan, the fan of whoever they are, the team, the player, the coach, uh, gets in a very sim similar situation and be more respectful. Because I think that was one very classic move by a lot of Chicago fans. I think for me, it's just like, and I, I want to shout out Ron Hopper. And tell me if y'all, some of y'all seen the, we were, and we retweeted them on X. Right, if y'all seen the photo of Ron Hopper trying to 
so Mrs. Krause. Uh, you gotta get Ron shot like he trying to like do his best to console her in that time. And, you know, she's at the elderly age herself, mind you. And I don't know how old she is, but you know, to get out in the winter like this in Chicago, I don't know if she still lives in the area. Maybe do, maybe does, maybe do, maybe not. I don't know. But, you know, to, to her to come out like this and then, you know, get all this, this showering from the people inside the building, all that stuff. From Well, I'll get the ownership here in a second. From ownership on down, you know, all that good jazz. You 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 know you figure um, that <coughs> things will be great come celebration time, but it didn't happen like that. I don't know why it didn't happen like that. You figured you know it's always the thing we talk you know talking sports, winning um, hides a lot of things. And the Bulls, and the, with, with, with the, uh, Mr. Krause's time there, is winning. They hit a lot of things. Now, of course, you know we, you know we've seen the documentary and what has come out about that. But still, winning hit a lot of things. Jerry Krause, like I say, not perfect, like you lose to. Did a great job. We we even talked on this very show, D Lock, that he was trying to trade for Trace, a rookie Tracy McGrady. He's gonna give up on Scotty for Tracy McGrady, and as we know, McGrady became a future Hall of Famer, and he kind of he saw that it's like. I remember my little got this kid now. And of course, you know, I think Michael they kind of balked at that, but and I think at that time Michael was kind of right because where you at where they're at right now, it, it won't be good for him that for Tracy McGrady in that situation. So I think it kind of worked out for all parties involved. But sometimes like some people like some pe- people got to like sit back and kind of read the room sometimes. Her husband did, been, has been dead since 2017. Dead for like seven years. You know, like I said, she up in the age. It's a chance to kind of like honor her husband. You know, all view is always accomplishments and all that stuff. Because Jerry Krause, I don't know if people don't know this, he's not a, a basketball guy per se. He's he's more of a he was more of a baseball guy than anything. Even like even leading the Bulls, he went back to the baseball world and scouting all that stuff. It's just the wine stores, because he used to work with the wine stores for the White Sox, and that's how he wanted to give the Bulls. But his heart was probably more in baseball. I think he just kind of like got lucky with Michael Orr being there and then kind of did what he did. That's, you know, blossom to the Bulls dynasty that we still talk about to today. But like you said, I hate that the fans did that. I don't know why you did that. You know, some people point out on Twitter, I don't know if you saw this, they point out about like Michael Jordan. Like, hey, man, like, some people point out, hey, Michael Jordan quit in your team twice. When he left the first time, and wherever story you won't believe, he quit that first time. Who knows how many more times would they want would have won if he didn't retire for X reason you won't put there. So, 
that's a fair point right there to bring up. But I, I, I'll leave it at this. I blame kind of ownership how things ended with those Bulls teams in the 90s. You got to blame them. And we kind of still seeing the effects of their ownership today with the Bulls. Not, you know, not handling Derrick Rose better. The post-Jordan era. I mean, granted, Kraus was there, but how that was handled. You know, and then, you know, look at today's era. We talked about this show in the preview show, like, even the free agency, like, why are we resigning, why are we signing these guys to three-year deals? Why are we signing these guys that you barely made the playoffs and you got limited, eliminated in the playing game? And you kind of regress with this core of guys that you have now. Why are we doing this? And it's an ownership thing. That plays a huge part. I mean, a lot of times, you know, these teams have some, some a good amount of rotation of guys, and some don't have enough. Some just have just too damn much. You know what I mean? And it's about how you put that team, those team together to be able to, you know, get the right pieces in and, and, and connect when you need to. I mean, and that's what I think Mr. Crowd did with the Bulls. I mean, you knew he knew what they needed when Michael Jordan continued to lose, and he went and got those pieces. No matter how he did it. You know, and then maybe he felt as if, hey, well, at the time this is what we do have, and I want to continue to build. You know, uh, use the same thought process. And hell, I mean, we hear a lot about that with other teams, you know. And it just having, I guess, a lot of players speak out, have the thought process behind it, fans feeling how they feel because they weren't in the office. A lot of fans, as we know, wouldn't know what to do in that situation. There's been the times us as fans see. A situation where, you know, in the sports world, like, damn, like, if that was me, this is this doesn't make any sense. Why would they do? But when you're actually in that specific situation, you know, in Mr. Krause's uh, situation, how to operate with, you know, the money, you know, the plans, the contract, you know, if you're not in that office and know how to deal with that, then it's very hard to actually know what they're going through with it. You know, so, uh, again, even with all of that, you know, they booed a guy that had a team that won six titles, NBA titles. They booed a guy that had a team that had the best record ever until the Golden State Warriors broke it recently. They booed a guy that had a team that had a few players on the top 75 players in the NBA. So for me, I just... It sucks to see that I was overlooked, you know, uh, and, you know, hopefully, you know, moving forward, a lot of these team fans uh, take note of that and say, hey, that wasn't uh, showing no appreciation. Because, you know, you, you look at these different decisions and, you know, he was a, he was a person just like in. Just like, like every other fan that was sitting next to another fan, that is a person. And um, for him to do so much, so much, I don't think a lot of the fans would have uh, been that successful if they were, you know, in his hands, in the same shoes he was in, just, just like that. Yeah, I, I just, I, I just hated for the wife like that, like. You know, mainly for the wife, and then you know, even, even the the uh, family as well. The rest of the family, if something like say some they trying to do some event for the Bulls, and um, you know, down the line, you know, a couple years, or, you know, whatever, some event like some 
maybe some black and white, some black and uh, white event attire, whatever event for the Bulls, and you know they want to buy their family, like, and they say no, I, you know, can't blame them. Yeah, it might be a better control environment, but you know why don't want to go back to the, that kind of mess? So I was just like, I hate that for her. You know what I'm saying? I think you gotta remember the good times that you had with them. Like I said, brought six championships to, to your team. He helped it. Found Phil Jackson. And now we kind of regard Phil Jackson as one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time. Scotty Pippen's a Hall of Famer. Michael Jordan's a Hall of Famer. You know? Steve Kerr kind of built his reputation first with the Bulls. That kind of, you know, won him championships there and then with San Antonio win another one. And then, you know, look at him now. Was it uh, a commentator for TNT? You know, worked in the front office for the Phoenix Suns, and now you got the uh, the Warriors job as a head coach and has won four championships there. You know, Rodman. You know. Say so won by Rodman, but he was instrumental in helping Detroit win two rings. Had a rough patch after Detroit, but went to the Bulls and, you know, helped them there. His name got bigger. We went to Chicago. You know, all the stunts he, he did, the wedding dress, which, you know, don't like, but that, you know, being part of the NWO when that was white hot back in the day. He got more famous from that. So, like, Bulls fans, like the bull, the 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 bull that guy. Look at this, the bull a guy that brought your team the best success that it's had, and it hasn't been replicated since. Shameful on y'all, to be honest with y'all. Shameful. Just shameful. I'll let you have the last word. Yeah, man, it shows that nothing else matters. And uh, for me, I think that that is not a not a way to go about it, especially showing that you know, not everybody's everybody's going to be different. They're going to have different things that they go through. Um, and it's not going to be just about sports. Knowing that his wife is there to represent him. Um, so it just shows you how, you know, how heartless some people can be. Uh, so, again, you know, it sucks that that had to happen. It's just mind-blowing to see it. Uh, especially to boost somebody, like like you said, to do so much for a franchise, man. I mean, it, like it kind of scr- makes you scratch your head and think about, you know, hell, for somebody to be so successful and you to boo, you'll boo to anything at that point. Yeah. So that's just, you know, we look at that as, like I said, to this day, I'm pretty sure a lot of them fans will say that Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. They will say that 97 Bulls team is one of the greatest teams of all time. They'll say that 97 Bulls, 97, 97 98 team will beat the Warriors team anytime. You know, these are the things that they would say. But yet, you would beat, you would boo the, the, the guy that had constructed it and put it together. So, uh, for me, like I said, I think. That is the confusing side for me. I think that uh, this is something that, again, a lot of people see how heartless some others can be, and uh, you know, hopefully, this is not something we see from other other teams because that is just uh, very much, very much shameful, in my eyes. So we'll we'll leave it at that. Like I said Bulls fans, y'all gotta be better than that. Got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to. 
Uh, to go to some scores real quick. Uh, today's scores in the NBA. The Bucks are up on Kings 115-107 in the fourth quarter. Uh, 21 triple-double for Sabonis. You play FanDuel, played him, you're cashing out pretty big tonight. And plus, he shot the ball very well. So you're definitely cashing out very well tonight. Uh, Sabonis with 21, 12, and 13. De'Aaron Fox, 17 points, 5 assists. 15 off the bench for Malik Monk. For the Milwaukee side of things, 23 uh, points for Malik Beasley. You know, this, you know, I'm gonna say this. This fool couldn't shoot with a lick with the damn Lakers last year. And he had his chances. And then he gets the Milwaukee and, and playing better. Let's make uh. Bobby Portis, 22 points. 10 rebounds. He's been playing out of his mind this year. I think he may be leading the six man of the year, in my opinion. Cameron Payne, 15 points off the bench. Giannis with 20 points and nine rebounds. With four minutes left in the game, uh, Bucks up by four. The Clippers down to the Timberwolves, 91 80 with 6.57 left in the uh, fourth quarter. Kawhi Leonard, uh, 24 points for him, seven rebounds. Uh, 60 points off the bench for um, Powell. Uh, 31 points for uh, Edwards. 15 for Carl Anthony Towns. Let's stay on the Clippers real quick. Kawhi got a three year deal with the Clips uh, the other day, which will keep him in LA in his mid 30s. Were you surprised by Kawhi getting that three-year deal? Uh, not really. I mean, usually we see guys like this get a big deal, um, either before they're about to their contract is up or after they win a you know a championship. Uh, but I think Kawhi is you know one of the better players in the league. And they want to continue to keep him in L.A. Uh, I don't think he has any plans to leave, but to make him happy, obviously, I think one of the things that hurt is sitting when he wants to. Uh, that is something that was big that he can't do. So, you know, paying him was something that was all important. And for this team to go anywhere, I think they're going to need Kawhi to move forward. Um, I think that, like I said, they put they yeah, they put away they put together a very good um, you know, a very very good um, very good roster, and we've seen it over time. Um, you know, right now they're they're going up right now, and and the Lakers are actually going backwards, which is a different conversation for a different day. Uh, but um, even though they just lost the Lakers recently, um. The Clippers are on a, a a very very good good winning streak right now. You know they've been playing outstanding recently. Um, so I think you know signing Kawhi was something that was very important to them, and they wanted to make sure that they got him got him locked up. Um, so I think that it wasn't too much of a surprise to me. Uh, it had been a surprise it was somebody else like a Paul George, you know, or Russ or somebody, uh, but. You know, taking care of Kawhi, I think, is that he's a lead captain of this team, and that was something that had to be done. So, to me, I'm really not too much surprised, to be honest. Yeah, I think it's like you got the new arena. You've been Steve Ballmer's been building that up, re- renovating and all that good stuff. So you had to. Um, Make sure you have like a selling ticket there to kind of sell your fan base and all that, and kind of not like I don't say like grass rooted, but you, you know you move to Inglewood, and you know you move from from down to L.A. to Inglewood. Which got some of y'all listen to this now. It, it's it's different. You know if Terrell Riggs is still listening to to the show. 
you know, just live in Southern Cal. Two different places. Not Southern Cal, all Southern California is not the same thing. Every little place is, is like its own different vibe. And to kind of get to Inglewood and all that, and kind of grass rooted and having Kawhi there, I think that's a great start. And then whoever your future face of the franchise is, you got to build up enough good fan base with the Clippers down in Inglewood that, you know, Kawhi could be the ambassador, which I don't know if he will do that or not, but he could be that ambassador for you for that franchise. And per- possibly the person that would be inducted to your ring of honor down the line. You probably do that with probably like Blake Griffin and Chris Paul and DeAndre Jordan first, maybe. But Kawhi is that dude. So for him to get the three-year deal with his injury issues and all that stuff, hey, kudos to him. So um, shout out to him getting that three-year deal. Oh, yeah. That's big right there. Lock him up soon or quick. And then other scores around the league. Let's see. The Suns and Blazers just tipped off uh, early in the first quarter, tied up at four. Final scores today, the Nuggets beat the uh, Pacers 117-109. Jokic had 25 points, 9 assists, 12 rebounds. 25 for Jamal Murray, 25 for Michael Porter Jr., 20 for Aaron Gordon. For the Pacers side of things, 12 for Benedict, uh, Benedict Mathurin off the bench. Buddy Hill, 16 points, who's back on the trade block again. Uh, Bruce Brown, 18 points, 10 rebounds for him in the loss. And then the Heat defeated the uh, Charlotte Hornets, 104-87. LaMelo Ball back in the lineup, 21 points for him, 10 rebounds. Terry Rozier, 26 points. No Brandon Miller due to a back injury after a dunk attempt the other day. So, this came back from one injury and then get himself injured again. Not a great season for uh, the Hornets so far with injuries. And uh, for the Heat side of things, 24 points for Bam Adebayo. Team rebounds for him. Seven assists as well. Uh, still no Jimmy Butler. Uh, Tyler Hero, 21 points. Richardson off the bench, 11 points. 19 off the bench for Duncan Robinson. So it's good to see Duncan Robinson kind of continue his play close to that playoff run. Like he didn't, they didn't hide, hide him back in the weeds due to his bad play. So it's good to see him get consistent time there. To the college side of things, real quick, uh, UConn number four, UConn beat George Georgetown 80-67 with uh, twenty six points uh, for for Carabin, twenty points uh, for Spencer to lead away for the Huskies, eighteen points, uh, thirteen rebounds for Cook for the Georgetown Hoyas, but wasn't enough to. Help power them through. FAU 86-73 over UAB. Memphis, a team that's really nobody really talking about. 112 uh to 86 beaten down Wichita State. 23 points for Javon Crinley, 11 assists for him. It's also Walton, 23 points as well. 14 points off the bench for uh, Tomlin to lead the way for the uh Tigers. Some people are saying it's upset today, but Maryland, they beat uh, Illinois 76-67, 28 points for Young, and 8 assists as well. Uh, for the final line night, the Mosk, 26 points for him to uh, lead the way there, but it wasn't enough for the final line night. But D-Lock, I want to bring this team up real quick. 
And granted, yes, they won today against Washington, uh, 73-61. But the UCLA Bruins, they called a beatdown before we got the air. They called a beatdown against Utah the other day, 90-44. Let me ask you this. Since the turn of the century, UCLA has gone through a, a host of coaches. You know, we got Mick Corden right now. Now, you know, Steve uh, Lavin, uh, Steve Alford, uh, Ben Howland. I probably missed somebody after Howland. Why can't UCLA get right in the basketball department in your eyes? Like, like before me, you, me, and you got off the, uh, got on the air. We talked about Nick Saban and retiring. You know, you, and you get ask me my thoughts on the hiring, all that stuff. And what that I brought up, it all save his time there at Alabama. How many coaches that Florida has replaced? Tennessee, LSU, Texas A&M, Mizzou, Arkansas. The Mississippi schools, all the schools except for Georgia. Why can't UCLA get right in your opinion? Because right now the um, Bruins they're sitting at seven and ten. What, why why this school can't get right in LA and all that stuff? Well. Uh. I mean, I think one of the biggest things is, you know, as you you talked about before, um, since uh, 2003, you know, so about 20 years, they've had four different coaches. You know, since 2000, Ben Holland was there, Steve Alford, you know, uh, Bartow was an intern, and now Colin. Um, I I think that you know you find these teams that um, continue to replace, and the chemistry cannot be established, right? Not only you know it can't be established, but now recruiting continues to change um, because you're not just replacing the head coach; you're replacing more likely his staff as well. You bring in a new head coach; he's more than likely going to bring in his staff, recruiting coordinator, position coaches. In any sport. And when that continues to happen, it continues to turn over. So for me, you know, when you continue to change these things, you never get to have a full run. Um, you know, we know uh, what UCLA has consistently brought uh, out of college basketball, like the you know basketball names. You know, they, they brought off. Uh, a lot of big name players, you know. Uh, so for me, I think that they want to get back to being competitive, you know. And it's they made their noise you know, in the tournament and uh, and continue to. But when you continue to replace, um, you, know, you continue to replace your your players or your coaches. You know, it does make an impact on how consistent, uh, you know, this this team can be, you know. Uh, and obviously the thing about basketball, you know, you get you that one player that is going to go to the league after a year. Um, he can he can definitely change, you know, the university. But uh, when you continue to replace that coach, the coaches, you got high school kids like, well, hell, I'm not going to go somewhere where – you know, a coach is going to be there for half a season or a couple seasons. Um, I think that that plays a huge part, you know, um, especially on a college level. You know, because like I said, you got these coaches that go talk to the kids, you know, get in their houses, you know, have a conversation with the parents, you know. But, you know, they're only there just for a short period of time. Then it doesn't last long, you know. So, you know, right now they're, 
very inconsistent. Um, I kind of have this comparison to my Orlando Magic, you know, who are actually playing pretty well this year. You know, they're used to starting something out, starting out with a coach, and then replacing them every two years. You know, and um, I think that UCLA uh, needs to keep, <coughs> you know, their coach for a while and, and let it work out. Um, and I think that that can play a part because all it takes, again, is that one player to come come in, for that one recruit to come in and change everything. You know, make that run in the tournament. Um, you know, and especially with the history that UCLA has. Uh, so I think when you do continue to replace your, you know, the most important person on the you know, most important person on that team, which is the coach. Um, you're going to have these problems where you can't be consistent, you know, because that beat down against Utah was one of the ones that was, eye, was an eye popping, you know, um, that's something that, that definitely stood out. So, uh, they need to be consistent with who they have. Um, to be honest, this is one of the seasons where, you know, they're going to look at some of these losses against number four Marquette, you know, Gonzaga. Um, Utah, they're going to look at some of these losses and consider do they need another coach, which is something that they don't need to do. You know, let the let the, the right recruiting group come in and, you know, go from go from there. But also I think a big thing that plays a part in that is, you know, not many people think too much is it's the alumni. The alumni are the ones, a lot of them are the ones that are like, listen, we're not performing how we want. Hey, let's bring somebody else in. You know, they, they, they want to see the success, but sometimes have that impatience. And sometimes the alumni who are putting money into the university are the ones that make those huge decisions or they play a part in those huge decisions. And we see it, you know, not only in basketball, but football as well. So uh, for me, I think that uh, when you continue to switch coaches and figure out hell who they want to, who they want to have specifically, who's going to come in and make a change immediate. Sometimes that takes time. You know, sometimes it takes for that philosophy for that coach to get his, his philosophy and to get things moving forward. Um, and I think, like I said, for me, if they do do that, you know, we'll see them have that run. But, you know, when you have multiple different coaches, when you have, you know, some shocking losses, which happens in college basketball, uh, that shouldn't waver if they should fire a coach or not automatically. Um, it plays a big part, but also sometimes it's good to say, look, let's give this person some time uh, so we can see that big difference. Uh, hell, you know, we've seen it, much as I hate to say it, with you know, Jim Harbaugh, you know, with the guy, with the group that he had. It took time to see them make moves and be good and, and you know, make the playoffs, get blew out, and now they – Mess around and got to the playoffs and they won the whole thing. So, you know, it takes time for that. And I feel like that's on any level. Uh, but again, if UCLA could do that, knowing the rich history that they have in basketball, I think it could be very beneficial for them because as on any, um, as on, as for college, any college sports, you see a team that, that makes a run, recruits eyes are popping like crazy. They, they see that and they would love to go to where success is. You know, you, I know, I'm pretty sure you, you definitely know how it was in Alabama when Nick Saban continues to win championships. You got kids are just wanting to sit behind, you know, five other five stars just to be there. So, you know, Calipari also has experienced that at Kentucky. Coach K and Duke, you know, others. So, um, you know, if, if UCLA can, can follow that mold, Get somebody the time. Um, you know, I'm not saying that they'll con continuously be winning temperatures every year, but I think they will compete, you know, a hell of a lot better if so. I think real quick for me, I think Mick Cronin is a guy that's kind of like, like, like Michael Manager type of coach. Not necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes – that could tune out some guys. And we kind of seeing that now. Like you mentioned about the talent and stuff like that with Cronin. 
you know, it seems like more finesse right now. Instead of having like, some athletes, some guys that like our future first round picks. I mean, granted, yes, I know the belly kid left early, but still, still got, I mean, still got enough rich talent in LA to kind of bring somebody in to kind of replace that. Yeah, I think we're not seeing that this year. And then, you know, another thing, they're going to the Big Ten next year. So, yeah, your cross-town rivals, they ain't been playing, they ain't playing hot either. But one thing you got to do, you got to at least show that you're better than your cross-town rival. But I don't think you're uh, ahead of that right now. And, you know, go to the Big Ten, you got, now you, now you're looking at playing Purdue, Michigan State, Michigan, uh, Indiana, you know, those schools going down, you know, Maryland, if they get, if there's another two, never team, never school, they get to act right. Got to think about that. So, you know, Cronin is a guy that I wasn't kind of put like Steve out offer. I wasn't big on it. And yeah, granted, yeah, he got them to that final four. You know, that good jazz. But I just thinking like, I don't know, does it get better? Maybe, maybe not. But to go out on your back like this on the last year of the Big Twelve, I mean Pac Twelve, it's not gonna be looking good come kind of Big Ten uh play next year. So Nah, yeah, it's gonna be like I said, it's gonna be definitely a challenge, man. Like they have to they have to come with it. They gotta be ready for it. Uh but now you gotta be on that recruiting trip. That guy you have to go on that recruiting trail. So So yeah, I had to ask you thoughts on that real quick before we get out of here. But this has been our show tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in with us. If you're out in the cold or in the cold area, make sure you stay warm and ready to wear out there. So you will be copping those bad situations with snowstorm coming through most of the country. So do keep that in mind. D Lock, how can people find you on social media? You guys can find me at Black Dash eight one three. Black the word dash eight one three on Twitter. Our Instagram is D Lock eight one three. Let them know they can find you at the show's page. Find the show's page on X slash Twitter at Fastbreak IESR. That's Fastbreak IESR. Do follow All Sports Radio on all your social media feeds. X slash Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. We're there. Also, do follow IESportsRadio.com for all your latest shows, news, and feeds as well. A lot of good shows on the network. Uh, the three and out series had breakdowns for all the playoff games. So do uh, check out the uh, playback of those on YouTube or how you receive your podcasts. Uh, do follow me on Twitter at Spawn4288. That's Spawn4288. Do check me out, uh, The Crooks Process, on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. I, I, I am post, I'm working on a couple episodes. One talk about Nick Saban retiring and the hierarchy on the board, and then the other one talk about Mike Vrabel and his firing with the Titans and a lot of mess going on with that. So do look out for those two episodes to drop here pretty soon, and do follow the Crooks process, like I said, on Facebook, Instagram, and like I said, follow me on Twitter as well. But this, like I said, be our show tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being t- tuning in with us. We'll talk to y'all next week in the world of basketball. Enjoy your MLK day. Stay warm. Talk to y'all later. Peace.